everyone, and welcome to Dead to Rights, the podcast video for the crime genre industry. I'm your host, Donna Carrick, and today we're going to be bringing a patron of the arts, the literary and crime genre arts in particular, on to talk with us. And her name is Jane Peterson Burfield. She's the author of numerous short stories. The list is far too long to uh, run through right now, but many of them have been award-winning stories. So she is really a fabulous writer, and she is also a huge supporter of authors, in, especially in the crime genre industry. So I know that you're really going to enjoy um, seeing her today. And something that you should know, at the time of this taping, our film that was produced by Cat Mills and Felicity Destravo of the CBC as a CBC jam short document called The Maydams of Mayhem, The Women Who Love Murder. And you can look it up on YouTube if you haven't seen it. It's a short 15 minute film featuring The Maydams of Mayhem. And it's got four of our authors uh, closely featured. A number are in the film, but Four in particular are closely featured, and they are Lisa DeNicolitz and uh, also uh, Jane Peterson Burfield, myself, Donna Carrick, and also Melody Campbell, who you've seen here on Dead to Rights as well. So we featured a number of the Maydams here on Dead to Rights, and uh, we know that you enjoy getting to know them. And please go and watch this video and by the time this airs, we will know whether our short doc produced by Cat Mills was actually a winner or a runner up, but it was great just to be nominated and to know that the film is out there and being seen by people because it really is a labor of love, this writing life of ours. Anyway, now, without further ado, I bring you Jane Peterson Burfield. Hi, welcome to Dead to Rights. How are you today? I'm very well. How are you, Donna? You look wonderful. Very well. well, thank you, Jane, and so do you. You oh. always look so beautiful in blue. Con considering COVID, I, I think... <laughs> We're doing well. <laughs> We're doing well, exactly. I considered just pinning mine up and saying to heck with it today, but then I thought, no, no, nobody will recognize me if I pin up my hair. I better have it down. <laughs> it, it looks nice. Yeah. Oh, well, thank yeah. you. Thank you. I love your painting in the background. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, quick story. It, it was over the uh, fireplace in our home on Glencairn, our family home that my girls are still in. And it was damaged. It had belonged to my grandparents. I didn't know anything about it. So I thought I should get it fixed up for the girls. It turns out it's an unknown burner. Uh, he did a lot of buffaloes and uh, native paintings. And this is a landscape, it looks like, from England. So oh. um, the uh, gallery was terribly excited about it. But now it's, it's down because it's, uh, I, it's too heavy for me to get back up on the hooks on my own. Yeah, yeah. So you've just got it propped against the wall there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You'll have to have somebody in at some point and put it up because they need to be loved. You know? I know. I, it's behind pillows because of the cat. Yeah. Well, this is our little secret uh, that I can share with you that uh, Alec and I actually, we love paintings. We, and in particular, we focused on Canadian artists, um, people like Goodrich Roberts and uh, Stanley Cosgrove and, and uh, that lot. We have no group of seven, no, that's far beyond our reach. But uh, we have, for example, an Arthur Schilling. Uh, I have an Arthur Schilling, a very, very early one that my dad bought before he was known and he couldn't afford paints. And oh. I love it, I love it dearly. Oh, yeah. so do we. We just love ours. I'll have to show you at some point. But um, anyway, it. that's a secret. Don't mm -hmm. tell anyone. But that's a little mini passion of ours. <laughs> of course, we can't afford to indulge it the way we'd like. But, you know, <laughs> um, the very interesting thing about uh, the visual arts, like painting, they do trigger the ability to write, don't they? They do. Um, they really do. I find that's very helpful. Yes. Uh, at the moment, I, I have a lot of books around about art, and I sometimes, when I'm at an impasse, I, um, I pull one out and I look at it. Um, when my decorator was choosing artworks to put up, mm -hmm. she actually put one up just across from me uh, that looked vaguely familiar. 
and I didn't realize it was one that I painted back when I was in my 20s. Oh. And I, I didn't realize. <laughs> that uh, was it good? Did you like it? I, I could show it to you, but I, I don't want to make you seasick. Oh, it, it, literally just over there. <laughs> I'll show you something. Oh, yes, yes. Later on then. That's funny that you say about the art books. Alec has uh, studied art books for years and uh, he loves nothing more than to curl up with whatever his current passionate for a painter is, you know. Um, and, and so I've learned by osmosis through his learning. I'm not uh, as knowledgeable by a long shot, but I've learned little tidbits along the way because of his study of it, you know, so. Lovely, when the kids were little, I would take them to the Art Gallery of Ontario and we would bring uh, each of them a sketchbook and a pencil and they would sketch Henry Moore's. And it wasn't until I tried doing it myself that I realized about negative space in a, mm -hmm in a work of art, I, I really wanted to, to open up their eyes to art and to yes, yes. everything else. Very yes, important. The same thing. That's so funny. We're not even here to talk about the visual arts and it's funny we're on the tangent. We took our kids out to the art galleries and the, um, and the art stores like the, the Roberts Gallery and, and uh, you know, all those places. We used to do that every February when we were stuck in the city and couldn't get to the cottage. Um, we would go out to all of the, all of the different galleries and, and muse museums that we could get them to. And they knew the rule, they knew the five foot rule you know, even when they were very little. And they respected the rule. They were so good. If you teach them young, they understand. And I remember we went out to, I think it was, um, is it McMichael's? Yes. Oh, I love it. And we had the security guard following us at a 10 foot and just watching our children with this big scowl on his face. And when we got through the whole gallery, he said, you've got very good children. I said, well, they just have been around art before, so they understand. They understand the five-foot rule. Every time they would get sort of close to something, he'd look like he was going to pounce on them, you know? And they'd yeah. just stand there and admire it. They'd never get too close, you know? So. Children are so much more capable than many people give them credit yes. for. Um, music. I, used to t I bet you did, too. We used to go to the young people's uh, concerts. Oh, great. TSO. Um, Theater. I started taking them to theater at the age of three. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, they were given sort of total attention and, and told the rules of the theater. Mm -hmm. and, and they, they're terrific. They've, uh, they've spent a lot of time in the theater. So yes. you, you can do amazing things with most kids. You know, some kids are just full of energy. Some kids just can't sit still. That's true. That's true. But, you know, I, I never regretted giving them that little bit of appreciation. And the way I look at it from a writer's point of view is, Jane, I have no talents beyond writing and knitting. Um, oh, but, oh, but, sorry. <laughs> but whenever I need inspiration, Mm -hmm. any of the other arts have it in spades you yeah. know um, understanding that most of the artists including our own canadian artists had very little recognition in their lifetimes and yet their passion never abated yes. you know? yes and i think this is this is what must carry any artist or writer it must you know and to see through their eyes to yeah. see the world through their eyes opens up your own world yes. so much yes. Yes, yeah. I think so too, yeah. Anyway, but you've had quite a life. We got to get on to you. Enough about art, now about you, <laughs> your love of art. <laughs> yeah, I've been very lucky. <laughs> yes, yes, you have. You've lived your whole life in Toronto, so you know this city extremely well. Um, are there any parts of this city that kind of inspire your writing? I think oh. I know the answer, but I'd like to hear it from you. Very much so. Uh, actually, you may not know this, uh, but genealogy, I've been looking, my family has been here since the 1840s, 1830s. And I'll go and look for where they used to, to live. And a couple of the buildings are still intact as, mm -hmm. as they had lived in them. And that pulls me back much the same way Maureen Jennings um, uh, series does. I think that's mm -hmm. really nice series. Um, so that's one. Water water always inspires me uh mm -hmm. so i'll go down um you know to, to the lakefront um i have pictures of my grandfather rowing at balmy beach back oh. <laughs> in the um the 20s um wow. so uh, uh everywhere the, the people i love living 
in the center of the city because it's so mm -hmm. vibrant yes and so alive and you you can just pick up so much positive energy and mm -hmm. interact with people i love chatting making a new best friend every day yes so. yes it's a good city for that it's a really good city and we are blessed with our harbor front and i've been to your home and your locale is just gorgeous and fun and really electric i love it here i love it here yes. so it does inspire your writing now let's get a little more specific are there any stories that come to mind that were really inspired by the locale um actually my family home has inspired a number of them uh i lived at uh one house on a quarter acre lot until i was seven and then at seven moved next door <laughs> mm -hmm. to my grandfather's uh, uh house my grandparents house uh on the same quarter acre lot and that has so many embedded deep memories that i tend i find that i have it in pretty well every story I write. Mm -hmm. um, in There Be Dragons, I, I sort of wrote about a garden mm -hmm. and um, sort of used some of those components in the staircase. In, uh, oh, in, in much of the writing, I've, I've used that. Um, in Requiem, which, uh, which was really interesting to write, I used the, um, the old formula, not that my ancestors had ever been dentists or anywhere near dentists, but they had the old um, sort of cures and, and poisons mm -hmm. in, in the underground under our house. And uh, so that did that. Currently I'm working on a story where I'm using the garden shed in the garden mm -hmm. as, um, as sort of a, a prime part of it all. In that shed in Requiem. So we've had a little bit of a taste of that shed in Requiem. I was thinking of Requiem, but There Be Dragons actually was nominated for an award, wasn't it? Yes, it was a finalist for the um, Arthur Ellis Short Story Award. Yes, so if you don't know Jane's stories, you must look them up. Look up There Be Dragons, and I believe that was in uh, 13 Claws. Yes, it was. Yes. You had to write and about an animal. Yeah, and look up uh, Requiem, which is about, well, it's got a theme of music in In the Key of 13. They are really beautiful stories. They're not your only beautiful stories, but they're the ones that connect you most to the city, in my view, um, and to your home. I mean, your home is really, the home is really a character in Requiem. Yes, um, the one on 447, yes, very much. Yeah. Very much. The garden was... Uh, was spectacular there. And when I write about lilacs overhanging, I can be there and smell them because we had them right around the garden. We had the smell of heavy perfume from the peonies. We oh. had the lilies at night that would sort of perfume and, and almost knock you over with their oh. the power of their scent. Mm -hmm. um, and the iris, the endless, endless rows and, and clumps of iris. Mm -hmm. Over 300 varieties. My grandfather um, uh, bred iris. He was a gentleman gardener. <laughs> oh. And he, uh, he, so, so that's very important to me. That's a very strong memory. Mm -hmm. yeah. I yeah. see it. I see it in your work, definitely. And again, it puts me in mind of when you talk even about the flowers, it puts me in mind of J.E.H. MacDonald. Oh, yes. Garden. Oh, I yes. love that, that image. I just love that image, you know? Yes, very much. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about how you structure a story because you do it very well. There are no seams, you know. Um, everybody's got their own way of plotting and putting together a story. And sometimes you can see the seams where they've been worked together. But with yours, they're always very organic. They always oh. come right out of your character's heartbeat, you know? And uh, what, what is your methodology for putting together a story, for structuring it? Um, I, I write almost like an actor does method acting. Uh, I tend to write initially chronologically, and then I'll uh, decide to move to an in media uh, uh, race uh, sort of beginning because you have to, you know, I'll usually cut a swath at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, it's really hard for me. I, I wish I had a formulaic method of writing because it, it's, it's very painful. You're, 
you're literally building the layers of an onion. And I like it when various uh, aspects of the story resonate throughout and resonate with other aspects of the story. The title to me is very important. The title oh, has mm -hmm. to almost be a secret key into mm -hmm. um, the meaning of the story, the essence of the story. Mm -hmm. so, I don't know, Donna, I'm not organized. I don't think I'm very good at it. Uh, I, I wish that I had more method. But it feeds out of you the way it is. I don't think you need to look very far to change oh. anything. You know, I, I find that it it comes in, as I said, every writer has their own style. Some are brilliant with the plots and the twists. Some are brilliant with the deep insights into the character. And, you know, some have just a package that is there waiting to be sort of unwrapped, you know. And it's almost an accident, I find sometimes, yeah. that different plot keys actually fit. It's, mm -hmm. almost, a, it's almost a happy accident. Um, I'm thinking in terms of, uh, for example, the, um, the arsenic and the fact that the arsenic had been used in dental care. And yeah. uh, there it was, you yeah. know, right there. <laughs> you know? I actually- One had... just needed to reach up onto the shelf and there it was. And it was, um, I actually, had uh, endodontic work. I had to have a root canal done by uh, Dr. Glar Gary Glassman, who I actually mentioned in, in the story. Um, and he was intrigued with what I wanted to do. And so he was telling me all sorts of ways to kill people. I find this fascinating. People are just so willing to help you kill people. <laughs> You know, it's, it's kind <laughs> it of scary. Is it really is something, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Now, another aspect of you, besides your award-winning and nominated stories, which are really brilliant and deserve so much attention, oh, another aspect of you is the fact that you are so supportive of fellow writers. And I just want to touch on that a little bit too. Okay. And I want to take this opportunity to thank you on behalf of so many authors we know for everything that you've done and uh, let people know. What motivates you? What drives you to connect in that way, to, to, to help out in that way? I think it's so important to pass it forward. I've been I've been blessed with wonderful opportunities in my life. And the very least I can do is to try and pass it forward. Writing and reading, um, it's one of my passions. And so what better way than to try and encourage um, Canadian writers? Uh, Val McDermott actually had quite a bit to do with it. She was over for the um, Bloody Words Conference, or BoucherCon, sorry, BoucherCon back uh, when SARS was on. And uh, she, of course, loves short stories. And uh, she actually came up to me, I just about fell through the floor, and said that she had read my short story in the program book uh, from Bloody Words, and that she, she really admired it. And I thought, holy, holy, you know, this is just amazing. So I said, you know what? I think we need to encourage the short story, which was fading back in mm -hmm. 2010-ish. Uh, and um, it was important to me also to encourage Canadian. I think we have, I think we're in a renaissance of writing here in Canada. I do too. I do too. Do yeah. Yes, I absolutely agree. And it's one of the reasons I do what I do. So that's oh, why yeah. I'm interested in why you do, because I wondered whether we had sort of similar motivations, you know? Yeah, you do amazing things. For oh, well, I'm, thank you, I'm thank so you. grateful. To I, wasn't, I wasn't trying to get a... <laughs> oh, I know, I know. That came... That oh, came that that is. This is about you. This is yeah. about you. <laughs> no, but uh, I think you're amazing. But anyway. But no, I agree with you completely. And I think that um, under-recognition is really a problem. And I think it's something that we have it in our power to try to do something about it, to try to lift each other up. And we have such fine writers. We, we have do. such thoughtful people, men and women across this country. I'm interested in, in writers and artists from all over the world. I'm not Canadian centric the way that some are, and I hope I don't get slapped with a maple leaf for that. But, <laughs> but having said that, that I'm not Canadian centric, I also recognize that there is a need for us in this country to allow our voices out. 
more. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and and to be heard, you know, not to have every story automatically change from Toronto to New York if if yeah, we want Toronto. any exposure yeah. in uh, in the states. No, no. I had I was in one uh, short story anthology, um, uh, a Poe, uh, sort of a, a sort of an honor to Poe called Nevermore, uh, mm -hmm. and I think there were two Canadian writers in it. And so it had to be structured so carefully not to, not to be Canada centric, but more North American centric. Mm -hmm. um, that was a pleasure. I was trying to go almost for magic realism. One thing I love about short stories, I didn't in initially like them at all, but one thing I love about them is they let you try different things, different characters, different uh, ways of writing, of telling stories. And that's, that's such a rich sort of field. They let you dip into the mind well, rather than having to take a great big, a great big uh, bucket and, you know, carry everything out. You can just dip in and sample a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And like you, I didn't used to like short stories. I wouldn't have read them. And in fact, I remember feeling betrayed when D.I. Warshawski would publish a, a book of shorts. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, oh, she's... Silly me what I didn't know at the time about yes. this art of ours, that the short story is our palette. Yes. Really, isn't it? I, I didn't know. I still have tucked away in the back of a drawer a novel I was working on. Um, and actually, it was analyzed at Crime Fest by... Uh, two eminent uh, writers, you know, editors, whatever. And they said, get writing. And, and I haven't, I switched over to short stories. And uh, it, now, it, I said V.I. Warshawski, who of course is the character. I meant Sarah Paretsky. Yes, I, I knew, I knew. Thank yeah. you for not correcting me on that, but you should have. <laughs> no, no, she's, uh, she's brilliant. She's a wonderful she's, woman. Yeah. She's on uh, FaceTime, she actually, uh, friended me on FaceTime. Oh, great. And uh, that's, um, that's a wonderful method of, of getting in touch worldwide. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you about uh, trying different voices in different places. Mm -hmm. uh, England for me is very easy. Um, I'm over at Crime Fest. I, one thing that I, I'm so proud of and shaken by is the fact that uh, Crime Fest did a 10th anniversary uh, anthology of all of the top authors. I mean, we're talking the top authors and they dedicated it to me. <gasps> I, I cried, I, I oh, cried. I didn't know that until I saw it. And, and Congratulations. I, I know, I, I literally have goosebumps now. I, I, I why? I mean, I, I cried, I just cried. It's, uh, but there's such wonderful, people and such wonderful stories and I like the subtlety of a lot of their their mm -hmm. crime I mean I love American authors I adore Canadian authors mm -hmm. um, but I really have a fondness for British ones too and all authors all authors have a voice and it's mm -hmm. so interesting getting to know them the thing I love I love when I'm reading along reading along and I'll think to myself and it's clearly been edited for my part of the world. So it's written in my use of the English language. So there's not really a clear indicator. And yet something in the outlook of the story tells me. And I'll go and check. And sure enough, the author is from Australia or the author is Scandinavian or the author is British or the author is from the south of the U.S. Or there's just some little tell, you know, yeah. there's some little tell just in the outlook. Um, before you even get down to the geography of the story, you know? Yes, yes. And it's so interesting. There are so many, I mean, the Scandahoovians are all very dark. Well, I, I can't say that in a sweeping <laughs> gesture, but a lot of them are very dark. I, I, my <laughs> father was Danish, so I, I, I can say that. But, um, I, and it's, it's so interesting, um, the slants that different nationalities seem to have you know and and conflicting slants within that not you know it, it's fascinating mm -hmm. it's fascinating to me uh how uh each you know sort of area of the world sees the world yes yes exactly the view from here you know and that's why even though i don't consider myself canadian centric i work with authors from all over and i enjoy authors from all over um 
I have to stand up for the view from here. Yes. Because the view from here is damn fine. You know, we, we, we so do. Lucky. Yeah. I know. I, we, we are so lucky um, on all aspects here in Canada. And I sometimes think we get quite arrogant about it. And yep. we shouldn't. Yeah. It's a matter of luck. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, we, we really are in, in the availability of opportunities. And thank mm -hmm. heavens, um, everybody is starting to look for more divergent voices here. I think that that's so important. Yes, yes. And you and I are going to have a conversation offline about exactly that, because that's something I wanted to pick your brain on. Um, it's, you know, it's difficult in this country within our genre to yes. find that diversity and we've got to so we'll come I back have an idea offline. okay good thank you hold it for me okay. <laughs> unless you'd like to express it now by all means yeah. no 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 this, okay. this is this is for you <laughs> okay okay very good thank you yes and jane you know what are you working on right now you mentioned about an anthology coming up what are you working on? i'm working on two separate short stories um one is uh, one was is very was very dark to write, and I've changed the approach, and it's it's going really well now. It's um, I actually use COVID to kill someone. <laughs> okay, good. And it's it's not going to be a noir. <laughs> There's also going to be a, a large um, animal that 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 gets involved. Okay. Um, uh, I also have a ghost story. I'm very very interested in. I guess what we call them are woo-woo uh, aspects in writing. Um, it's it's uh, it's a ghost story. Uh, Madeline, um, um, uh, our friend Emma Scalway, yeah, is, is working on one. It turned out we were both going to work on a ghost story at the same time. So I'm sort of letting her go first because, you know, you you don't want to influence or be influenced by. Exactly. somebody else it's very important to maintain that um those walls but yeah. uh, it, it's 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 intriguing to do it's intriguing to do good. So, um, good i thought about that too i thought that must open up some rivers of thought um you know i've never really felt the draw to write a ghost story until recently yeah. and the only reason is because i think it might open up some rivers of thought that maybe don't come easily to me, you know? So. Do you find that writing, I find writing is almost on a silver slide right into my soul. It, it's, yeah. um, it's one reason grief can be very difficult and can block it. Um, music is much the same. Uh, classical music sinks right, right into my mm -hmm. core of being, my spirit, my soul. Mm -hmm. And writing sort of, plums in well that's yeah that, anyway it gets into that as well do, do you find that as well i do i do and it must the thing is the writer the writers that i enjoy the most are the ones who don't try to stop that and i'll hear writers especially new ones they'll often say that uh they didn't want to get too emotional with this they want to you know but that's not the point really no. is it you know, the point is to be what we are and allow that expression forth, you know, pull it out from inside because nothing else really has any meaning. You know? You're so vulnerable when you write. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to be open to allowing that to happen. Yeah. Um, you, you, you really are. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult process. It's not an easy process. No. But, oh, it's satisfying. It's cathartic in yes. some ways. Don't you yes. find? I do. I find it very cathartic. I think that I've been able to handle a lot of the things in my life because I do this yeah. one thing. Yes. You know? I know that sounds maybe oversimplified, but uh, that's the way I view it, you know? Yeah. And beyond the act of the writing itself, there are the people. Oh, you know, yeah. people in our, our community, our crime genre community, and you are such a, a, a big part of all that, Jane. But uh, tell me about your experience, your ride in the crime genre industry. It was so interesting. I always wanted to write, but I never felt that I had enough experience to write. I was always one of those silly people that felt if you were going to play the piano, you had to play like... Um, Rubenstein, the first time you sat down, or it wasn't worthwhile. And I had the same approach to painting, 
I had the same approach to writing. And um, so I, I sort of, you know, I taught writing at Humber College. I worked as a journalist, was my first job. Uh, did corporate minutes when I was in business. So that was a different form of business writing. But um, it wasn't until I was just turning 50 that I, that I turned to, to writing um, creatively. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it was, uh, oh, you're so naive and so hopelessly, romantically sort of able to enjoy when you think you know everything or think, think oh, yes. you'll be able to learn everything even, you know, it's a, oh, yes. it's, it, it's such a delight. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I waited a long time and then uh, life really happened in spades. Uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, uh, personal, um, yeah. Yeah, personal tragedy, a lot of health problems. Uh, one, one story I was writing, actually the one for Nevermore, I couldn't see for more than an hour a day while I was writing it. Um, I when you were going through that. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was a little on the difficult side. So I, I can touch type, luckily. So I would write in the morning without necessarily having to read the screen. And then I could edit for that one hour a day. Yeah. Uh, it slowed the hope. I'm I'm not a fast writer. That's that would be one of my wishes that in five mm -hmm. years I could be able to write longer, uh, sort of more quickly. But it doesn't happen. It, it's it's an organic no. growing. Um, I, I can't even describe it. It's a story arc. Working in the writing industry, it's a story arc. And here is how the arc goes. As you say, you begin with a romantic vision of what being a writer is. You're going out to book meetings, you're going out to uh, readings and signings and, and uh, you know, your, your work is hugely successful. <laughs> um, and that's the romantic vision going in that you've got something to say and you're gonna say it. And you start to get over the crest of all the hard work that goes into it. Yeah. And then as you're approaching that crest and you're almost ready to give up, suddenly you've got this network of people they're who are lovely. going over the crest with you that you never knew existed. Yeah. And they're just going over that crest with you and they keep you going despite yourself and you yeah. keep going. And then you start to come to the other side of the crest where you realize that nothing that you thought mattered at the beginning matters. Yeah. That yeah. huge success, that romantic vision, that uh, having something that you think is so important to say, none of it mattered. What mattered was simply being yourself and giving over to your expression as an artist. And being having the friends Not doing it with you, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's beautifully put. That's oh. beautifully put. And so true. Mm -hmm. So true. That's yeah. certainly been my experience. You know, I wouldn't give up my writing friends for anything. You know? Oh, I know. They are so kind, so caring. Uh, and it's not just in the writing uh, aspect of our lives. It's in all aspects. They're, they're just there for you. And this is true. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to go to various conferences uh, in England and in the States and here in Canada. And it's true for all of the different writing groups. It, it's like we're, uh, we're our own separate tribe. <laughs> yes. And, uh, but they're so generous, a generous of spirit in helping wherever possible, in um, encouraging, in, in holding your hand when you need it. Uh, and, you know, it's a pleasure to be able to do the same back. So yes. Yes. it's very special. It's very special. It really is. And we have hardly touched on any of the things that I wanted to ask you about, Jane. But I want to take a second just to, because I say that you have all these titles, and I want to make sure that, that our uh, listeners understand. Like, I have a list here of titles that I, I've printed. And, I mean, we're looking at The Santa Game. We're looking at uh, Slow Death and Taxes, Crocodile Suitcase, Basque... Um, well, okay. Belief, the inheritance, triskaidekaphobia. Did I say that correctly? Triskaidekaphobia. Yes, very, very, very much. Hidden, There Be Dragons, Requiem, and the film, which 
we learned today is going to be showing at the Yorkton Film Festival. And uh, we knew for some time that it had been nominated, but we didn't know how the showing was gonna go down. It's going to actually be online. So the next time we chat, we'll know whether it placed. Yes, so, I'm, I'm gonna watch it. Uh, oh, so am I, yes. It's very exciting. Kat Mills, who was our, our uh, be all and do all uh, in putting that film together, uh, is a remarkable young woman. Mm -hmm. She's very talented. She's uh, so I really wish her the best. Yes, yes. Well, I'll certainly be rooting for her and for all of us. And your yes. part of the story, your part of the story leads me to something that I did want to ask you about. Even if we run out of time, there's one thing I want to ask you about, and that's your time in Uganda. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Not asking you to repeat what's in that film, but you know. Uh, it was back in 1973. I was uh, just in my first job. I was at a job interview to get it. And apparently what got me the job at the Canadian Real Estate Association was my chutzpah in mentioning that I was going to Uganda to be uh, entertained by Idi Amin for three weeks the next summer. And I would need that time off if I were to accept the job. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently they had much more qualified candidates. But the, uh, the boss thought, Anybody who has this amount of, of chutzpah should uh -huh. get it. Uh, we went as part of the um, YMCA Canadian delegation. We traveled with the US delegation uh, to an international Y conference. Uh, we knew it was iffy. I recently just came across um, through WikiLeaks of all funny things, uh, US diplomatic chatter about it and about uh, how worried they were about, uh, about us going over. It was fascinating. Um, but I, I've been involved in the Y all my life. My dad was, my grandfather was, et cetera. Um, and it was very important to support it. So, so we went and I saw things I never thought I would see, um, in, including uh, two young boys who lost bits of themselves at, at 12 and 13 mm -hmm. in front of us. It was a ritual. Um, and and they, uh, they sort of were subjected to the ritual. We, I mean, you, you're in a world where uh, our rules of social nicety simply don't apply. Yeah, yeah. If anyone has not seen The Last King of Scotland, I highly recommend it. Um, I'll give you a forewarning. If you're queasy, don't. Yeah. But if you want to learn something about the part of the world that Jane is talking about, The Last King of Scotland is... Um, focuses on Idi Amin's reign. Yeah, yeah. It was fascinating. I'd read Heart of Darkness in high school. It was one of my favorite books. And uh, that really spoke to me all the time I was there. It, 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 was, it was an amazing experience. It's Again, easy to see how that funnel works. And, um, you know, I, I, I have a very strict policy on this, uh, on this um, interview process that we don't get political, but it is easy to see how that funnel into darkness is employed, isn't it? Yes. And yes, being aware much. anytime, and you always have to be careful. Always have to be diligent. You do. You, you, it's sort of like being on the internet, it, a good training before this, because you always know that whatever you do could come back and bite you at some point. Yes, yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> what is it that uh, our older generation, our school teachers used to say, manage your thoughts yes. because your thoughts are you, you know? Oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's going to be my theme for the week. I love that. Oh, you, excellent, <laughs> excellent. I'm glad we could share that. Yeah, Jean, yeah. thank you so much for joining us today on Dead to Rights. Please don't hang up. I, um, I really appreciate having you here and we're going to talk again, but uh, I just want to say thank you. Well, thank you, Donna. It was my very great pleasure. I will do anything at any time to help promote uh, Canadian writing and, and you do such a wicked job. You, you really are amazing. Oh, excellent. Thank you. I want to thank Jane Peterson Burfield for joining us today on Dead to Rights, the podcast video. And I also want to give my thanks, as I always do, to Ted Carrick for the wonderful theme music, Eyes of Gold. And with that, we'll let it carry you out until next week when we bring on another author on Dead to Rights, the podcast video for the crime genre industry. Thanks and see you then.
dusty road, a man alone. His vital signs go on hold. And I don't know what you've been told. But the years have turned my eyes gold. And I told you what you told me. We'd never be in the same boat for free, yet it rides, let it rock.